brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> this will be a rather curious and unusual talk to serve as the beginning for today's conference. It's not a scholarly paper uh, in the usual sense. I was asked to put together some personal reflections on Father Stanley Light as an extra to be sort of tucked in at the end of the conference before Vespers. But now in the changed circumstances, the extra has been put up front, the caboose has been put in front of the locomotive engines, and I think we need to keep the sense of humor and perspective and about what I'm about to say. Uh, by way of explanation, I spent the academic year 1970-71 uh, in Bucharest at the Theological Institute of University Rank, as it was then called, the Faculty of Theology as had been, was hermetically sealed off from the university, uh, but granted the status of a university education. And I took uh, various graduate courses in Eastern Orthodox theology, among which were all the courses taught by Father Dumitrius de Mulai in dogmatic theology. I arrived there knowing virtually no Romanian. You can remember the taxi ride from Otopay, uh, in which I spoke only with nouns to the taxi driver. It's amazing we got to the Institute at all. Um, but in the time that I spent there, with the strong background that I had in, in languages, uh, I came to love uh, the Romanian language. And as I was leaving the country to go back to the West, Father Stanivai asked me to translate into English a series of articles he wanted to be known outside of Romania. Uh, then, perhaps more than now, but I'm not sure how much more than now, uh, the number of people, theologians who read Romanian, uh, was extremely small. So if there was to be any chance of knowing the work of Father Stanislav, it was imperative that it find its way into English or French or German. I was very moved personally by the trust that he showed in me. I must say that even though I attended all his courses, there never really was any great personal relationship between us. Another of the professors had kind of taken me under his wing, in part, I think, to get English lessons for his son. Um, but there wasn't that kind of relationship with Father Stanley Roy. The only thing that I can think of that might have been part of this was that I've had the uh, habit all my life of looking at teachers. And it's amazing how few students actually do that. And teachers begin, in my experience, to start teaching at you if they know they actually have someone who's, who's listening and looking. And that may have been what prompted Father Stanley to ask me to serve as his translator. And I brought out, with the help of Father Meyendorf and St. Vladimir's in, in New York, um, a collection of articles of Father Stanley Many of you will know the book Theology and the Church, which has gone through a number of editions, and then the beginning of the translation of his Dogmatica. Now, what I'll try to do this morning is to offer two reflections on the person of Father Stanley at least as I knew him as a student. And then to suggest two elements of his life and work that I believe have significance, speaking for myself at least, for all Roman Catholics, and in fact I think for all Western Christians. Let's start with the reflections. My first reflection is on Father Stanley as a teacher and theologian. And I'm thinking of his presence in the classroom here rather than the impact of his writing and his ideas on the page. Among the professors at the Institute in those days, this is 1970-71, there were about 10 to 12 professors who taught at the graduate level. 
he was clearly unique. He wasn't the most scholarly professor in the Western sense of the word. Uh, that was probably Father Dr. Alexandru Elian, a very distinguished Byzantinist, uh, who had the scope of a Nikolai Yorga or Mircea Eliade. Um, but Father Stoniroi was something different. He wasn't a specialist in the way that most of the other professors were. Uh, they tended to live, in my judgment at least, uh, having gone through university both in Toronto and in England, they had lived with a kind of compartmentalized approach to their area, their knowledge. They tended to be defensive and palpably taken up with guarding their own dignity as teachers um, and to some degree uh, their reputation. One of the things that rather scandalized me at that point, this is 40 years ago now, plus uh, in the theologate, in the Faculty of Theology, was that the books that Western Christians sent to Romania uh, to be used by the students and the faculty tended to find their way into individual hands. It was what was called the Fondo Special. Um, and in order to get your hands on those books. Students could never get their hands on these books, but the teachers could, uh, but it sometimes involved money because you could make money writing reviews and using these books for new articles. And Father Stanley Roy did not seem to be at all part of that kind of world. He was not a cooperator in the system, the system under socialism. It's hard to find the right word for this, and I don't want to be judgmental, although I and the other graduate students were all terribly judgmental about a whole series of things at the time. Uh, three times a year there was an ecumenical day, and people from particularly the Lutheran, uh, Calvinist, sometimes Unitarian backgrounds and Orthodox uh, teachers would give talks on some issue, and then almost all of the professors would stand up and comment. Most of those comments ended up being a denunciation in some form of Western world and Western Christianity. Um, and Father Stadiloy was always apart from all of that. He never took part in what was clearly a ritual that no one believed in. I remember meeting the head of the minor seminary on his way home from one of these days, uh, probably quite drunk at that point, who revealed to me that none of it made any sense at all. It was all something that they had to do and we went to take it seriously. And then realizing that he was speaking to a relatively unknown foreigner, he told me that if I told anyone else this, he would deny it to my face. But Father Stanley was not that he was a part. And what for us as students set him apart was the fact that what happened in his classroom was the doing of theology, not the study of theology. He didn't come in with a lecture which he read to us. We didn't work at the seminar and the study of a topic. He would, in effect, meditate on and make connections between the various dimensions of what he wanted to talk about and bring us into the process of this contemplation of what he hoped to be the truth. It was rather like assisting at a liturgy. The word assist in Latin is quite an important one. It means to stand towards and it has something of that sense of the apectasis, of verbiumness, of straining towards what's happening at the center, at the altar, at the table. And that was the sense of what Stanley was doing, and we were assisting at this. His two great themes were that of the Trinity, the very life of God, and here he was able to fuse the personalist philosophy and theology that he had studied himself and, and absorbed in France and 
Germany in the 20s with the foundational statements and understandings of Eastern Christianity over the centuries, the reality of the divine persons. And this came out in his every treatment of the Trinity, especially in the dogmatic. His other great theme was the world, Lumia. And here there was a profoundly theological vision of creation itself as the expression, the object of God's love, the principle of the incarnation, of the embrace of all of creation. This transcended the immediate reality of the world that Romania was living through in, the, in those years, in the 70s. Um, but it wasn't a kind of escapist fantasy from seeing more deeply into the heart of what is true for every human society. And the constantly recurring phrase that he used when he spoke of the world was the reasons of things, ratiunile lucruri, the inner principles of things. Let me just read a brief <coughs> text of his that captures this or at least my own attempt to get at it in a note that I wrote for the dogmatic. The ratiunile lucrurilor, these reasons of things, correspond to the Greek logi, and the, the term recurs throughout his work. These logi are the objects of the first stage of contemplation, natural contemplation. And as the intelligible, intelligible structure of created things, like the Latin ratio, they are all contained within the Logos himself as the unitary and unifying cosmic principle. This is the theo uh, Physici Theoria of, of Agrius. So the world for him was never a hostile environment. Christians had to flee. And in Romania in the 70s, there was all kinds of reasons to flee. And it wasn't an intimidating and somehow diminishing numinous presence, like many of these theories of the world as the earth as Gaia that uh, have come up in the last generation. But the world was the revelation of God himself, drawing us through it and upwards from it into the encounter with the ultimate personal reality. It always reminds me at the very end of C.S. Lewis's children's stories when the characters from all the books cry out to one another as they rush towards the center that is God, higher up and farther in. Again, the epictesis of Gregory of Nyssen. My second reflection is on Father Stanilwai as witness. The word itself is interesting. Uh, for someone who speaks English as his or her mother tongue, the Romanian word for witness, martor, suggests too quickly uh, the association that we would all naturally make with martyrdom. But there's another word in Romania for martyr, which is martyr. And I'm concerned, first of all, with the various dimensions of Father Dimitru's witness as teacher, theologian, priest, and Christian. There was the other dimension, the martyr dimension. He spent five years in prison. And this was something that was very plain to us, although he never alluded to it, nor did anyone ever allude to it in his presence. He spent five years in prison. And what we saw of those five years were his hands. They were the hands of a laborer. I don't know what he did for the five years in prison, but they weren't the hands of an intellectual. And he always wore what looked to us like lumberjack shirts underneath his rason, underneath his, his cassock. And even though the, the Romania of the time was filled with the language of work and scientific socialism, muncitor, etc., uh, here was an example of someone who had worked and was working. As Jesus said, I work even now, and my father is evident. 
A later discovery for me was to know that this witness was someone who had been a journalist for years and years and years. He was the editor of a very prominent paper, even though it was produced under ecclesiastical um, auspices. It was widely read uh, as a commentary on the life of Romania at the time, the Telegraph of Romuni from Sibiu, where he was in the faculty of theology in Transylvania. Hundreds of leading articles on all the events and themes of the day of the 20s and 30s into the 40s. And not just church stuff, but politics, economics, the cultural and intellectual life of the Romanian people. You remember that Robespierre once boasted that if he just had one brief letter from a man, he could find enough in there to send him to the guillotine. Wells, for the standing away, left hundreds of articles which were enough to have the government take him away at any moment. The interesting thing is that they waited so long till 1958. But the, this commentary on society, particularly on what he called Bolshevism, towards the end as the war dragged on, was like a sword hanging over his head all those years. Now I spoke before of Father Stoney Loy's theology as something he was actually doing in front of us, in front of our eyes. He wasn't bringing into the classroom. And he was a witness to the union between meditation on the things we believe from God's revelation, what we call dogmatic theology, and what, as Christians, we, we call spirituality. And it's very important here for spirituality not to mean what it means in the mouths of so many Hollywood movie stars, a kind of posture, a style, people who reject any kind of religion but claim that they're very spiritual people. For him, spirituality was the actual working, actioni, of the Holy Spirit within each of us as Christians. His exploration of the <coughs> distinction between the energies and the uh, essence of God, as uh, worked out by Gregory Palamas, his dedication to the provision of a philokalia in Romania, I'm not sure how many volumes of finally published, I think it's at least 14, much richer, a living document, not <coughs> something resurrected from the past, but something that was happening in the very life, of not just of the monks uh, and nuns of Romania, but of the people. Again, a world in which this witness was wider, it was ecclesial and not ecclesiastical. Pope Francis has recently spoken in a disparaging way of a church that is self-referential, a church that's just talking about its own affairs, it's using its own language. And for the study law, he never did that. Finally, his witness, <coughs> his dialogue with the minds and spirits of his own time, uh, older figures like Lucien Blaga, Mihai Sora, the periodical Gundiria, all part of the effervescence of life in Romania. He was one of the interlocutors of that. His connections to people like Bart and von Balthasar in the West, and the frustration of not really being able to be in dialogue with these people because of uh, the inability of his own work to be present to them. But even more, the living presence of the fathers as interlocutors, not voices from the past, but people, in a sense, present around us in the classroom. And people of the sort that Western Christians were less familiar with. Maximus, the confessor, Simeon, the new theologian, Gregory Palmas. This was the patristic renewal of which Father George Borowski spoke and wanted to see flourish among all Christians, but especially the Orthodox. Let me end by just touching on two elements. I won't have time to develop these, but um, elements that are significant, I think, to us as Roman Catholics looking at the life of 
Kristen Loy. The first is what might be called the elephant in the room, which is his, and I'm not sure about the word here, but it's provocative, but I'm going to use it, his anti-Catholicism. He grew up in Ardeal in Transylvania, a world dominated by Hungarian and German communities. It's a bit like the theme of Maître Chez Nous here in Canada, where the Romanians felt that they weren't in control of their own life, their own territory, because of the influence, particularly of the internationally connected Catholic reality, even more than the local Protestant reality. Um, as a journalist, he had a strong and he raised a strong political voice against Catholic influence, including the monarchy imported, as it were, from another country. This was in his roots, and I think it bears that same sense of frustration that we in Canada know sometimes in our French-English dialogue. The thing that's more important, I think, in his writing is his use of the scheme, the schematic device, which was so common in the writing in the Romanian theological journals. Namely, the notion that everything could be studied according to the three confessions, Dupa, Cilitre, Confessio. Orthodoxy, of course, Roman Catholicism, and uh, Protestantism. It was a kind of Hegelian schematic, not so much thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, but exaggeration one, exaggeration two, and in the center was this harmonious expression of everything that belonged to the Orthodox tradition. Um, I think Father Stoniloy may have, under the conventions and pressure of the day, used that formula, that scheme, uh, too easily. Um, it doesn't really correspond to the reality that we've seen in both Catholic and Protestant traditions since the last 40 years, where there's been so much change and development and incorporation into Western Christian life of elements which for the study Roy would have presented as inimical, impossible to digest for Western Christianity. Study Loy, however, I think was right in uh, being anti-Catholic in some very important senses. Let me just say with some one personal thing. Um, whenever I'm celebrating the liturgy and the prayers, many, many of the official prayers in the Western liturgy, especially at the Eucharist, and per Christum Dominum Nostrum, through Christ our Lord, Amen. And I find myself now as a Western Christian with this years and years of experience of Eastern Christianity, wanting to say, no, 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 it has to be. In nombre tato, we shall feel, we shall simply do. In the name of the Father and the Son, you have to have all three. Um, and the short form is not ultimately the form that nourishes and expresses and articulates who we are. Um, Father Study Roy's own theology of the Trinity has certainly helped me to hear the music of the Western Catholic spheres in a way that I grew up never hearing it because it was always there around me. It was a wonderful thing to be a Western Christian in a very predominantly Orthodox world. Uh, those of you who are Orthodox living in what's such a predominantly Western world will know the exact opposite of that. It's a great liberation to be brought somewhere else. Let me end with uh, the second element, and this makes a bit of a transition to the theme of Constantine and uh, Helena. And that is the perspective of the larger theme of church and state. Romania in 1970-71, under Ceausescu, was a very interesting time. Uh, it was shortly after the invasion of Czechoslovakia. Uh, Ceausescu, in many ways, was a rather positive thing, not what happened later so much, although people knew very much his past. 
Uh, but the church was trying to find a space to exist within this theoretically communist world. It, no one was a communist. They were all, <coughs> everyone realized that this was something that lived only because of the Russian reality. But it always occurred to me when I heard that greeting, Sutraits, may you live that this was something that the church itself had learned to try to live within a world that was inimical to its very existence. The ministry of cults, the Mare Conducator, the great leader, these were things that had to be, phrases that had to be used, but you had to find a way around them. You had to find a living space somehow underneath them. And this raises the question, and I'll end with this. Um, Norman Baines, many years ago, wrote a very uh, important article, many of you perhaps will refer to it today, in which he spoke of Eusebius of Caesarea's ideology that he prepared for the new Christian emperor, in which the emperor was thought of as the the reflection of and even the agent of the Logos in the world, much more than Constantine being the 13th apostle or the uh, uh, bishop of those outside, the Episcopos Don Ectus. He was this presence of the Logos, uh, giving shape, bringing everything under the will of God. And that ideology, I think, uh, remains unresolved in many ways uh, within the Orthodox world. And it's not as if the Western world has found anything uh, better. We're living, I think, at the moment through uh, a reality in which Pope Francis is beginning the process of dismantling the vision of the Pope as a sovereign favor of the vision of the Pope as a bishop and pastor. Uh, it'll be a long road, and I'm not sure how far he'll get down it. He might even be assassinated before it's over. But it's a brave road, and uh, the road away from the emperor as Logos is maybe something comparable on the orthodox side. And we need to be supportive of one another as we set out to rethink what it means to be the church in a world which is waiting still for its king to return. Thank you.